platforms. Yep. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Power Podcast All-Star Live Streaming Series. I am your co-host, Brother Bedford, and we want to thank you all for taking time out of your life to be with us this evening. We pray that you all are staying safe. We pray that you are taking all of the necessary precautions to keep you and your family safe. And we also hope and pray that we are doing our job by serving you and providing some of the best and brightest minds that Black America has to offer with you. So I need you to do a couple things before we get into tonight's, uh, I'm extremely excited. I'm a big fan of John Hope Bryant, so I can't wait to hear exactly what it is that he has to share, but we need you to do a few things first. First and foremost, I need you to go ahead and type your name and where you're from in the comments section. That would give us a good indication where you're from. We know that people have been joining us from London, Africa, in the islands. So we've just been having people from all over the world chiming in to get this information. So we wanna know where you're from. The next thing I need you to do is go ahead and follow George Frazier's fan page right there. Just hit that follow button, hit that like button, hit that love button. Then that would let you get all of the updated information from Dr. Frazier when he posts something special, something intriguing, something exciting for you to partake of throughout the day. You'll get notifications by simply following the fan page. Another way that you can get notified, and we highly encourage everyone to do this, just go to www.newblackpower.com and just give us your name and email. And I'll personally make sure that you don't miss any of the live streams that are coming up. And we'll also keep you updated and give you some of the past uh, live streams that you may have missed. So go ahead and go to newblackpower.com and we'll be sure to get that to you. Also, last thing, Mark on your calendar this Thursday, we have Willie Jolly coming up. So we've just been having star after star coming before you and sharing some of the knowledge, insight and inspiration to you. So this coming Thursday, we have Dr. Willie Jolly coming. So go ahead and mark that on your calendar. And I know I said that was the last thing, but here's the last thing I need you to do. I need you to share this. Let everyone know that we're live and in living color right now with Dr. George C. Frazier and John Hope Bryant. Go ahead and share it right now. Invite your family and friends, put it in all your Facebook groups and let them know that we are live. And now without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to the hands of our host for this evening, the father of the networking movement, who's been the catalyst for many of us, taking, uh, connecting the dots and taking our platforms and building effective relationships, six best-selling books on the subject, He's the founder and chairman of FraserNet. He's the founder of the Power Networking Conference. And I can go on and on, but then we wouldn't be able to get into tonight's interview. So without further ado, I want to put you in the hands of Dr. George C. Frazier. Thank you, Brother Bedford. Um, I'm going to keep this short and sweet because I want to spend this whole solid hour, as much of it as we can, talking to a brother from another mother, uh, John Hope Bryant. This is a brother that I've known for many, many years years. Uh, he is really, in my estimation, the father of the financial education, the financial literacy movement, certainly in, in Black America, if not around the world, uh, with the founder of, uh, as the founder of Operation Hope. Um, uh, there is so much to say, so little time to say it. I have a truncated version of his bio. If I read the untruncated version of his bio, that would take up the entire hour. That's just how he rolls. Um, so I want to welcome him with just sort of doing a dramatic read of his bio while he's sort of getting his stuff together. And um, I, I think I have a little surprise for him, or certainly I'm going to prick his memory on something maybe he has, has forgotten. Uh, so this is John Hope Bryant. One of the one of the best looking dudes on the planet as well. He's brilliant and he's good looking. Uh, he's woke. He's conscious. Right. He's playing a violin right now. You, you maybe you can't see him. But anyway, uh, named as one I'm of the <laughs> and my friend, a, a longtime friend, uh, named as one of Atlanta Business Chronicles' most admired CEOs in 2018, America's Banker Magazine uh, in 2016 as Innovator of the Year, and the world's top 10 CEOs is an honorable mention, and one of Time Magazine's 50 Leaders of 
the future. And the future is now. He was named that in 1994. John Hope Bryant is an American entrepreneur, an author, a philanthropist, and prominent thought leader on financial inclusion, economic empowerment, and financial dignity. I love that term, financial dignity. For the past two consecutive years, John has been named in the 100 most influ uh, influential Atlantans, a listing developed uh, uh, by the Atlanta Business Chronicle that spotlights Atlanta's top business and civic influences. Uh, Operation Hope is acknowledged as one of the uh, number 34, actually, Atlanta's 75 largest nonprofit organizations included in the 2017 and 2018 Book of Lists, a publication of the Atlanta Business Chronicle. John is the founder and chairman and chief executive officer of Operation Hope, Inc., the largest not-for-profit and best-in-class provider in financial literacy, financial inclusion, and economic development, um, uh, uh, and economic empowerment tools and services in the United States for youth and adults. He's the chairman and chief executive officer of Bryant Group Ventures and the Promise Homes Company, the largest for-profit minority control owners of institutional quality, single family residential rental homes in the United States. And he is co-founder -co of Global Dignity. John is the author of bestsellers, bestsellers and I just, wanna, I just wanna take you through that. He wrote The Memo in 2017, Five Rules for Your Economic Liberation. He wrote How the Poor Can Save Capitalism rebuilding the path to the middle class. He did that in 2014. He wrote Love Leadership, The New Way to Lead in a Fear-Based World in 2009. And in 2002, when he was a young whippersnapper, he wrote Banking on the Future, a program for teaching you and your kids about money. This is 2002. He has a new book coming out uh, October the 6th, 2020 of this year, Up from nothing, the untold story of how we all succeed. So there's a lot to unpack just in his writing. So here's a little surprise. I don't know if John remembers this, but in 1998, I wrote a book called Race for Success, the 10 sure. Best Business Opportunities for Blacks in America. And on page nine, uh, 96, I wrote, and you can see it, it's highlighted here. Another person I admire is John Hope Bryant, a young man who was inspired uh, to found Operation Hope, America's first not a nonprofit investment banking organization. Bryant told Black Enterprise Magazine that Operation Hope was his guilt-ridden response to witnessing the riots in South Central Los Angeles after the Rodney King verdict. And I'm quoting him here. Here I was, a black man who had left his community and, uh, and become successful, thinking discrimination didn't exist. After watching the buildings burn the night after the verdict, I wanted to, I had to do something. He started Operation Hope. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, a brother of another mother, just an awesome thinker, thought leader, really the father of the financial education, financial literacy movement, certainly in our country, John Hope Bryant. John Hope Bryant, I genuflect, how you doing? What's happening? What's going on? As Marvin Gaye would say, um, what's up, my brother? Talk to me. So, so you don't walk on water, Dr. George Frazier, but you know what the stones are. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bad brother. I, I, I went flipping through the dictionary the other day, looking for cool brother, and it's like, dang, that's a photo of George. What the heck? <laughs> and, and, it, and the dictionary lied to me because it lied and said you had just ce celebrated your 75th birthday. I said, there's no way in heck. I know black don't crack. <laughs> this is ridiculous. That's this crazy, dude, right? like he's 35, that's not true. 75, and he defines <laughs> making smart sexy, defines it. We, 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 this country, in the last 20 years, Quincy Jones told me, it takes 20 years to change a culture. In the last 20 years, we've made dumb sexy. We've dumbed down and celebrated it. And now yeah. we have to make smart sexy again. 
And I think, Brother Bedford, you are in the right spot, the right place. Brother Bedford came to my office, said he, you know, he admired my work and maybe he wanted to work for me. And then the phone rang and it was uh, Dr. Frazier saying, well, I actually have a slot open. And he dropped me like a bad habit. And 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 didn't and didn't even say goodbye. I didn't say bye, Felicia. As he's leaving my office, ran over me. I got tire tracks on my face as he's trying to get to the real father uh, of silver rights, uh, which is uh, George Frazier. You, in a very serious way, my brother, are um, are, are following a path of um, Reverend Leon Sullivan. Uh, the first black man ever to serve on the corporate board in America. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was a GM board mm -hmm. uh, who created the African and African American summits, um, uh, who introduced me to Africa along with Ambassador Andrew Young. I mean, I don't really remember those planes that went to Africa. When those planes went down, all of black America would have been doomed. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Jesse Jackson, everybody was on those planes. Uh, the, the entire King family, you, me, um, and, um, that's when we call President Clinton an honorary black man. Um, but, but really, Leon Sullivan, uh, Dr. King, Ambassador Andrew Young, Frederick Douglass, Du Bois, this long, Harriet Tubman, this long trajectory of civil rights to silver rights, civil rights in the streets, silver rights now in the suites, yeah. civil rights about race in the color line, yes, extremely important, is real, silver rights about class and poverty. Um, my newest book, The Up From Nothing, The Untold Story of How We All Succeed, comes out in October. It's on pre order now. I just finished it literally yesterday. It was on Amazon. Yeah, it's like, well, hopefully it's everywhere, but uh, yes, you know, certainly on Amazon. And uh, I'll also be reading it in the coming weeks, so I'll do an audio version. But uh, I note in the book that, uh, that the word millionaire came, one of the top 10 words in the world, up there with Jesus, and, you know, a few other things. The word millionaire innovated in 1850 out of New York, uh, financing. Uh, the cotton and other things came out of the South, but mostly what they call white gold, cotton. Cotton took, uh, took hold after almost dying because of the cotton mill. And the cotton mill, of course, unfortunately made black slaves, I think it was 20 times more valuable. Uh, and that's unfortunately why slavery took off versus died. Uh, and you had this reverse transfer of wealth uh, where you did not get the fruit of your labor. So today, if Brother Bedford wants to see the fruit of his labor uh, and understand the difference between being of getting paid and being wealthy, because wealth, it starts from the neck up and getting paid is from the shoulders down. Uh, and, but Brother Bedford being smart, that's why I'm gonna work for you, not me. Uh, it, he today can have the fruit of his labor, uh, his hard work, his sweat, his, an entrepreneur works 18 hours a day to keep him getting a job. So he can take his 18 hours a day, or work from you nine to five, and work from himself five to nine. Um, he can take that and benefit in this uh, world we live in today from the fruits of his labor. But in slavery, literally, now by the way, I'm not making an emotional argument here. I'm not blaming white people. <laughs> uh, just to be clear, there were slave traders who were black. How do you think you got from the African continent, by the way? You think that white folks just walked into Africa and picked us up? So this was economic, unfortunately, bad capitalism. You had Arabs in slave trade, black Africans in the slave trade, Europeans in the slave trade, uh, Indians as in from India in the slave trade. That was the East India Company. It was just a horrible business model, disgusting. And, but the reality in America where my poor white brothers joined us in, as indentured service in 1619 they were got they got off it's like okay well this you're white you, you can go you, you can go be in charge of somebody black folks we didn't get we didn't get a pass we were enslaved forever but we were so hard working we were such agricultural geniuses no one picked us up because we were dumb they brought us from africa because we were geniuses of the soil 
We were African. We were we were brilliant people of the soil. So again, I'm not I'm not saying anything emotional here. But black folks were so industrious that they turned us into this incredible efficient money maker. The the richest city, George, in the world, not in America, in the world in 1850, per capita, was Natchez. I'm sure we're saying it improperly. Natchez and Natchez. Mississippi. Yeah. The rich, by the way, has a black mayor today. The not not one of the the richest per capita in the entire world just happened to be a slave port. <laughs> that was the capital of our import and the export of cotton. And it just so happens that that's the same era that the word millionaire was minted. <laughs> Is that right? Yes, we literally. Saying it on your program first, I put it in my book. I chronicle all this in my book, but I'm saying it on you. Literally the first time I'm saying it to anybody. The word millionaire comes from us. Now, here's the problem. Because somebody else literally got the transfer of wealth from us, we worked our tails all day, and somebody else went and bought the car. Back then it was a carriage, post-drawn carriage. They got the big mansion. They got, you had their servant. So the more we worked, the wealthier they got. It was a literally a reverse wealth transfer that that lasted 300 years. <laughs> Not 30 years. That'd be bad enough. 300. When everybody else in the world stopped slavery, like, oh, this is really horrible. And it's disgusting. It's immoral. You know, we made a little bit of money. We should probably stop this before God really gets mad at us and like make and, and like punishes like most sub subsequent generations. We should probably stop this. Uh, folks in America are like, oh, hey, no, no, this, this is intoxicatingly good money. And, uh, and when we carried it on for 200 years, longer than anybody else. And uh, another thing I'll say on this program, I've never said it before, it's actually not in my book. You probably know this because you're so smart, George. Uh, but I'm so excited to be on your program. I just want to say this. I have never said this before. Another reason that Black folks are really the reason, I'll, I'll say, one of the reasons that America is so amazing as it is today. That literally could not be America without Black people for this reason. The only nation ever to beat Napoleon's rear end was Haiti. You know the story, George? Well, yeah. Absolutely. So I won't, I, won't, I won't bore your, your listeners, viewers with the details, but they can re research. But the bottom line is, Napole uh, the, 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 this guy in, in Haiti brother, uh, beat up Napoleon's, uh, beat Napoleon's brother. Napoleon got his, his emotions all uh, it, it wrapped up in this and the ego. And Ambassador Andrew Young said that men and women fail for three reasons, arrogance, pride, and greed. And this guy was so prideful, you're not gonna beat my brother. I'm, a, I'm Napoleon. He came, he got his rear end whipped <laughs> by this dude. And the, the slave trade in the Caribbean was, specifically Haiti was financing France's wars around the world. So because Haiti's trade stopped during this brief period where Haitians took over Haiti, uh, and then their ego got out of whack, and that's a whole other story because they shot themselves in the foot getting emotional about their victory. Uh, they didn't leave their, their adversaries with their dignity, and ultimately they ended up getting overturned not only by their neighbors uh, next door, uh, which is, um, was it, uh, was it um, was next to Haiti? Dominican Republic, yeah, um, yes. and uh, and all the European powers turned against them. But I'm getting ahead of myself. France had was negotiating to sell New, what we now call New Orleans to the U.S., but they got so strapped, George, for cash because of of, of Haiti saying no mas. Mm -hmm. They had to sell what became the Louisiana Purchase, the equivalent of 13 to 15 states, for like pennies on the dollar. There would be no America without the power of black folks. That's right. The only problem is we've never been on the other side of the balance sheet. We keep getting on the reverse transfer of wealth side of the balance sheet. And today, and, and I'm about to shut up, Ambassador Andrew Young would say that men and women fail for three reasons. He also admires you. Arrogance, pride, and greed, yes. But he also says this, to live in a system of free enterprise and not to understand the rules of free enterprise must be the very definition of slavery. 
So if you're in a 500 credit score neighborhood before COVID, by the way, mm -hmm. here's what you see. Check casher, next to a payday loan lender, next to a rental owned store, next to a title lender, next to a liquor store, next to a pawn shop. And a church down the street making trying to make you feel a little bit better once a week. That's what we call a therapist, because we don't want to consider magic admit that we we cray cray. So we go to a church and we scream and holler on Sunday to make ourselves just sane enough and just calm enough to go back to work whatever on, on Monday and, and do it for another week. But I could have I could have described there, George, a black urban community, but it's also a, a poor white community. Poor white rural neighborhood has that same profile, 500 credit score community. So I've now decided that, and by the way, outside of a military base, you have all races of people and those same predators at the, 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 the gates. So I'm now convinced the color is green. I'm convinced now that the way we transfer this is not arguing about black and white or rich or poor or Republican or Democrat. It's the get it done party. It's, 100, it's, it's moving your credit score 120 points. Nothing changes your life more than God or love than moving your credit score 120 points. More important now post COVID, just maintaining decent credit than it was before, but it affects your self esteem your confidence, your belief in yourself, your optionality, your cost of funds, uh, your ability to move and maneuver in this world, uh, ability to get a job, they're checking your credit now. But it, ultimately, this is not about credit. This is about your mentality. This is about how you feel about yourself. And we talked about this earlier. The reason that you're so successful, the reason I love you so much, man, you're like the black poster child for empowerment, is you knew you were a winner, before you ever won anything. Yeah. And you had a challenge jacked up growing up. People think they look at you and they see, oh, he's so handsome. He's always had a silver spoon in his mouth. No, he had a dirty spoon and he didn't eat and he, and he didn't yeah. eat it because he had too much. But he George's background is challenged and interesting. But but George knew he George knew he was somebody. And he was gonna become somebody. And that's really, to me, what today is about, is us, anger does not pay a bill and, 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 and frustration is not a business plan. We can't be wrapped up in what somebody else thinks about you. I can't get somebody else's heart and change how they feel about me, but I can get my heart and change how I feel about you. We gotta take control of our, our own narrative and you have done that. Yeah. Um, I forgot to mention a couple of years ago at the Power Networking Conference gave you an award. I believe it was our Black, Cool, and Brilliant Award. Your writings, your lectures, your speeches, your, your commitment to, to, to financial education globally. Uh, you are most deserving of that award. No question about that. So I'm just going to throw down a couple of sentences here. And I want you to unpack them or respond to them. It is something that, and I have to preface this when I say to when I say this to black people in my speeches, I want to say these things and still be loved. Okay, that black America is in an existential crisis, and until black America puts black America first, black America will always be last. That to be black and beautiful in this world, John, means nothing unless you're black and powerful. Dr. John Henry Clark said that. I say, you cannot be black and proud in niggas too. White people are planning for three generations and we're planning for Saturday night, right? <laughs> the goal is to win, not to look like we're winning, right? Yeah. I would rather carry a plastic bag with $5,000 in it than to carry a $5,000 Louis Vuitton bag with $100 in it. We are addicted to instant gratification versus delayed gratification. It is interesting to me that the rich stay rich by pretending to be poor and the poor stay poor by pretending to be rich. What is up with that, right? If nothing changes, we are headed into a second slavery. That is what I deeply believe and we cannot and we will never manifest our dreams by complaining our way out of this current reality we have to deal with this reality no one is saving us but us 
It's been 400 years and we ain't saved, John. And what disturbs me the most in my nine and a half million frequent flyer miles, my 2,500 speeches that I've given over the last 40 years, my six book, six best-selling books, is that no matter where I go, John, no matter where I go, where black people have been dispersed, whether it is Seattle or Miami, whether it is San Diego or Maine, whether it is New York or Los Angeles, whether it is Cape Town, South Africa or Cairo, Egypt, whether it is Ghana uh, or Kenya, whether it is Rio or Bahia, whether it is the Bahamas or Jamaica, no matter where I go, African people are at the bottom of every single economic barometer and statistic in the entire world, including the continent of Africa, where we most we occupy, fundamentally own. God has blessed us with the richest of natural resources of any continent on the planet, and we're still the poorest people on our own continent. What is up? With that, we're 500 years in. We have given, as Sister Adu from Ghana said, who was the director, former director of the Office of Education, that we have given Western, the Western world everything that we have in 500 years. And therefore, we have nothing and you have everything. We're 500 years in. And then when the reporter who interviewed her, I think I sent you that little video, who interviewed her, a German reporter interviewed her and said, Sister Adu, do you think that Black people could ever forgive us? And Sister Adu looked at her and said, it is not about us forgiving you. You did everything you need to do to survive. The problem we have is we haven't done everything that we need to do to survive. We need to unpack that. What must we do? And I think it's in your, 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 your next book. What must we do as Black people to succeed, to survive, to overcome this paucity of financial literacy and education that exists among our people. We are the most financially illiterate people in this country. What is up with that? And how can we fix that? And what are, and, and I know how we can fix it. I'm asking a rhetorical question. You know how to fix it. You've been working on it for 28 years. But by the way, congratulations on your 28th anniversary today. Congratulations on that. Yeah, today. Today. All right. So I just want to drop the mic on that because that's the kind of conversation we need to have. What are the answers? Why is credit, for example, so damn important? Why is it important? And is it that difficult to fix? So in my homily, uh, brilliantly said, uh, of course, in my homily, I guess I didn't listen to you forever. My, in my homily earlier, some of the folks who are Caucasian who might be watching your program maybe feeling a certain kind of a way, maybe. Um, and I want to underscore here that my philosophy for life is talk without being offensive, listen without being defensive, and always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Because if you don't, they'll spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. Right. That becomes, because it becomes personal. And that's what happened in Haiti, by the way, that the, the Haitians got emotional about their success and and overclocked it and uh, and humiliated the French and others and the, the Europe basically decided you're going to be a poor despot for 500 years and uh, uh, the watch seems to be accurate. Um, so white folks have also been part of the success movement of successful black movements for social justice. I want to give them credit. The Urban League partially founded by Caucasians and Blacks and the NAACP. Yeah, yeah. Operation Hope has been supported by a rainbow of folks. I'm sure your organization and others. So I want to make sure it's clear uh, that that nonsense is nonsense, that there are good people and bad people and there are bums everywhere. I got bums in my family. I call it the bum factor. 20% of everybody are just bums. 
Um, and we need to call it what we see it. Now let's now go to your question. The, the ironing board, the home security system, the three light trap, the three light traffic light, the refrigerator truck, the automated elevator doors, the electric microphone, the carbon light bulb filament, the color IBM PC monitor. And go on and on and on. Right. Created by blacks. Found it. Mm -hmm. We are brilliant. When the rules are published and the playing field is level, we succeed. Look, look at the arts and sports. You look, either you run fast or you don't. If I fast the finish line first, I win. Rules are published. We we even took over tennis. <laughs> we took over F1. <laughs> when the rules are played, when the rules are published and the playing field is level, we succeed with the right mindset. You mentioned a word in your sermon of empowerment that is critical. You said we've been surviving. There is the whole ball game. In my new book, I call, talk about three elements, George. Um, Dr. French, uh, surviving. George, George is fine. Surviving, see when you're a bad brother, you say, just call me George. Yeah, yeah, that's, what, that's what other people do, Bedford. That's what they, they just call me George. Yeah. <laughs> That's how bad I am. Just call me George. Yeah. Yeah. Bachelor Young has 130, 130 honorary doctor degrees. Just call me in. <laughs> you know, when you, when you roll it like that. Um, surviving, thriving, and winning. So that I'm introducing the word winning now in my new book. Now, I want people watching this to pay very close attention. A surviving mindset is what you do when you know you've been put upon and you have got to somehow get through it alive. And when that's happened to you successively long enough, you get what I call modern urban, in this case, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. You become experts at surviving, not thriving. Your life becomes about ready, fire, aim. You be re when problems hit you, because life's all about solving problems and how you manage pain. When life and pain hits you, you react, you don't respond. You become emotional, not passionate. Mm -hmm. You let other people and circumstances get you off your game. And while other folks are talking about their great ideas, you're talking about other people. While other folks are talking about building wealth long-term, we're talking about getting paid short-term. Complete, we want to get rich, but the basketball player on the NBA team, but my friend Tony Ressler is sitting there on the third row in jeans and a turtleneck and with no fanfare, owns the team. He's talking about building wealth. He's bought the team with his petty cash, but the members of his squad are rolling in the most expensive cars you can imagine, dripped in finance jewelry, but he's paying them with his petty cash. He's writing the check. They're cashing it. Mm -hmm. You can never build wealth with a surviving mindset. The number one country, number two, number three, number four country in the world for patents is also the number one, two, three, four country in the world for GDP. Conversely, the country with one patent is a war-torn, incivil place of pure terror where you're just, hold on, surviving. You cannot create genius in an environment of warfare. I'm being dramatic for a point here. You need mm -hmm. calmness and thoughtfulness in order to have an environment of creativity where the endorphins on the right side of your brain pop. Because that's where love, charity, compassion, joy, faith, confidence, belief, opportunity, hope exists. And once, uh, and once the endorphins click on the right side of your brain, it's a doorway to the left side of your brain, which is the analytical side. But if the right goes dormant, George, if the right, goes, right side goes dead because you've been traumatized, you're trying to anesthetize yourselves from pain, now all of a sudden, 
everything short term feels good to keep you just forget about your mess. Alcohol, all the ing's, drugging, drinking, shopping, texting, partying, hanging. But ain't but you know what you ain't doing? I say ain't no purpose is doing, <laughs> executing, right? All right, building. It's the wrong ing's. Now let me be very specific. I'm gonna tell you a story that I've never told anybody is in my new book, but to me it's the whole book. A guy named Mike Mabel Jr. Uh, you don't know him, no one's ever heard of him, but he's worth about a $500 million. Uh, he's a venture capitalist, top 10 in Silicon Valley. I'm having breakfast with him. Hey Mike, how'd you, how'd you, how'd you become Mike? Make a long story short. He says, uh, well, you know, my mom and dad, tell me about your story. Oh, just normal mom and dad. No, mom, tell me. Well, my dad worked for, for uh, Microsoft. Okay, what did he do at Microsoft? Well, he worked for Bill Gates. Okay, now typically somebody who's an assistant vice president 20 levels down says that. This dude's father was number three at Microsoft. Now, so give you some texture for his dad. He, did, he created all products, the Microsoft 365, all that he created. This is his dad. So Mike's got a little business. It's a, a, a video, uh, a video, I think an arcade business. 15 years old. First of all, that's impressive enough. Uh, I think Bedford, George, if we saw that in our neighborhood, black person, young black man, young black woman creating a business at 10, 15 years old. We, we, by the way, George and I both started a business at 10 years old. So we can relate to it. But that's impressive enough. Fair enough? Sure. Okay. So now we're going from a surviving mindset to a thriving mindset. Okay, step in the right direction. So George has got a video business at 15 years old. George says, you know, Dad, I think I want to sell this business to Disney. Now, first of all, if a 55-year-old man thought he had a business well, smart enough, big enough, sharp enough to sell it to Disney, we'd all nominate him to the Black Enterprise list. We'd all say, fantastic. Mike Maple's father said, I'm disappointed in you. That's not how this family thinks. I said, Mike, what are you talking about? He said, daddy said this, son, you don't take your company and let it be purchased by Disney. You take your company and you buy Disney. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again so the people in the back of the room can hear it. <laughs> you take your company in this family and you buy Disney. You have a leadership perspective in this family. you got a winning perspective in this family. You are the check writer, not the check casher in this family. You set the agenda. The agenda is not set for you. At 15, can you imagine? This gives me chills. Can you imagine what it did the young Mike Jr.'s brain? his heart, his head, his psyche, his system. Can you imagine how it made him feel about himself? Can I get an amen that young Mike Jr. was told at 15 years old? <laughs> Come on now, mm -hmm. you can own the game? No, no, you have to own, no, no. That's the, the only option is for you to own the game. Right. Of course Mike Jr. is a half a billionaire today. What choice did he have? Right. That's, That's a mindset. winning mindset. Yeah. Mindset. And, and Mike Jr. knew he was a winner before he won anything. Uh, 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 LeBron knew he was a winner before he won anything. Oprah Winfrey knew she was a winner before she won anything. You knew in that poor neighborhood, uh, in a struggling family with challenged sibling situation and mom and dad, you knew, George, that you were somebody and you were going to be a winner before you won anything. So did I. That we have got that was robbed from us. Long way of saying, when you're brought here and you are twice as big as your overseer and you have them outnumbered, it's not personal. Get the personal out of this. Get your emotions out of this. In order for them to make this economic model work, because we were twice as valuable as railroads as slaves, they had to kill not your body, your spirit. Right. And they did things to kill your spirit. I can't say it on your program. But they separated you from your wife. They held you down. They did all kinds of things. Message. And they held you as you stopped fighting. Message you can't do nothing about. Just stop it. They wanted human machinery. And they. And by the way, it succeeded. So we can have high competence based on, you can have high confidence based on high competence, which is your skill to go do something. And listen now, still have low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. mm. And the reason we have crab in the barrel, and the reason that somebody's watching this program right now and saying, hey, who's he think he is? Hey, why did he take so long to endure and introduce 
Well, he thinks that's impressive because that's crab in the barrel. What we should be saying is, my God, listen to that resume. Oh my God, he loves short. Oh my God, look at Pepper. Oh, this, 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 this is amazing. I love everything they're doing. And if anybody watching this, listening to this, are you going on TV tomorrow? Are you listening to, on, and you hating on anybody? Doing something positive? Check yourself. Okay. This is the silent killer. Because if I don't like me, I'm not gonna like you. If right. I don't feel good about me, I'm not gonna feel good about you. If I don't respect me, I don't know how to respect you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. And here's a big one. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I will make your life a living hell. Whatever goes around, comes around. And I'm gonna drop this little mic on here. This, this, I'm gonna light up your comment section. I, I love my people. We're the most amazing people on the planet. We've been doing so much for so little for so long, we can almost do anything with nothing. That said, given what we went through, George, I think that 70% of us are clinically undiagnosed depressed. And I'm not talking about poor people. I'm talking about PhD holders, mastery holders, folks suited and booted and rocking, you know, why else do you need to roll up eight deep with sunglasses on at night and a bunch of bodyguards and you had one hit uh, as a rapper and you got to go up in a, 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 a club and throw thousands of dollars at somebody you don't know? Uh, why? When you got the power, you don't need to use it. Well, my point is that, that if white folks went through half of what we went through, they'd be crazy too. We went through it, but we never got therapy. We never got healing. And we didn't get the memo on money because money doesn't solve all your problems, but it's a great place to start. <laughs> you can distract yourself with a lot of positive things when you have some wealth, right? So we, the Freedmen's Bank, 1865, that was taken from us when Lincoln was killed. We don't have time for all this. We don't have time to go through all this. But mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass tried to take it over. People think he was a, as you know, they think he was just a philanthropist, an abolitionist. They don't realize he was a businessman. Or as Jay-Z would say, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man right <laughs> Freddie douglas owned 60 million dollars with the real estate in baltimore maryland and rented it out to working class blacks that gave him the financial freedom to go be an abolitionist we missed that whole memo we missed the fact that dr king's father served on the board of a bank for 40 years we missed we missed the civil rights part of the civil rights part and and we haven't healed the internal wealth which is the real wealth and that's why we're winning battles and losing wars that's yeah. why we're, we're hitting, we're doing, we're, we're, that's why we're, we, we, are inter, we are obsessed with entertainment and being distracted from our pain. And that's why we're being robbed in broad daylight, George. Robbed mm -hmm. in broad daylight. And we just need to stop. We just need to say enough. Right. Um... I'm going to ask you a question, but, but I, want, I, want, I just want to address something that, that's powerful. My other answers will be much shorter, I promise. No, 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 that, that, that's no, no, whatever, whatever you need to say, you need to say it. Uh, we don't get this kind of audience in this kind of time often. So, so say what you have to say, say what you need to say, but I want to go back to something you said earlier. And I 100% I agree that we don't have to hate white people to love ourselves. It ain't even about that. How can you hate black? How can you hate somebody else and love yourself? Yeah, 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 yeah right. Contradiction. It's about that deeply and, 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 and morally. That That's number one. Number two, we must understand that they, our allies, let's call them our allies, I see them as icing on the cake. I don't see them as the cake. Correct. I think. Correct. We are the cake. Of course. They're the icing on the cake. This is biblical. God helps those who help, help themselves. themselves. Right? So it begins with me first. Mm -hmm. Right? Begins with me. It, it's, it's how I define leadership. What is leadership? Leadership is first le you leading you. If you can't lead you, you damn sure can't lead me. Because you can't even lead you. That's number one. What is leadership? Lead, leadership of your family. If you got two knucklehead kids who are doing crazy and dumb things and, and snorting and doing crack, you can't lead your family. You can't lead, right? The next is leadership of the community, then leadership of our race. Very few rise to the leadership of a race of people. 
So this is work. This is inner work that we have to do. As you said, mindset, mindset, uh, intellectual curiosity, which leads to critical thinking, critical thinking, which leads to um, using the power of our creativity and innovativeness to leverage the incredible survival skills that Black people have. Hell, we made a meal out of chitlins. Right. I mean, we know how to survive and we know how to thrive. And there's plenty of evidence of that. If you were the doctor for African people and had to write the prescription. Now, you may have already commingled your prescription in some of the things you've already said. But if you had to write a prescription for us for the next 100 years, we've got to be on this prescription prescription every week for the next 100 years, right? What would that prescription read? What would it say? What are the things that we have to get right to move away from this crab in the barrel mentality, to move away from this notion that Black people are out of their natural minds, right? It's, as evidence in how we don't recycle our dollars, how we well, are we are the consumption class. They are the merchant class. We buy stuff. They make stuff. What, what's the prescription for that, John? Number one, we have to accept and acknowledge where we are. Um, accept and acknowledge where we are. We are a little crazy. By the way, most people are crazy, but we have, a, we have an excuse to be cray-cray <laughs> for the reasons mm -hmm. we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong being crazy. I love it. Jesus was crazy. Martin Luther King was crazy. A lot of people I love are crazy. Crazy like a fox. You just think differently. You are differently. You are different. And that's what makes you resilient also. So I would acknowledge our pain. Uh, number one, own it. Uh, number two, when you get mad at your son, uh, let's assume Brother Bedford's my son and Brother Bedford does something stupid. I'd say, Brother Bedford, you, 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 you anger me, you future entrepreneur. Uh, you anger me, you, 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 you uh, undisciplined future doctor. I, we need to call up our future, even in our worst moments. Mm. We need to own our pain because rainbows only follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. You cannot grow without legitimate suffering. We need to tell our children every day, as my mother told me, I love you. You can do anything you want to do. Somehow you survived, George, without that. Uh, uh, you thrive without that. But I had the benefit of my mother pouring into me. You are somebody, I love you. And that boasted, boosted my self-esteem. As Quincy Jones would say, not one ounce of my self-worth depends on your acceptance of me. As Reverend Murray would say, it's not what people call you, it's what you answer to that's important. Never ever answer out of your name. And then I added to argue with a fool proves there are two. Number three thing we should do is uh, as a result of being told that we are somebody, believe that we are somebody. Mm -hmm. Number four, we need to be obsessed with education. We need to take as much education as we can shove down our natural throats. I mean, we need to like go to bed. We just like have our mouth just like, just you know, manually held open. And somebody's pouring education every waking and sleeping moment we have. As much education as you can possibly handle it because that sets you free. We need a lesson in financial literacy. That's the new civil rights issue for the 21st century. We need a lesson in computers. You need to learn, turn your dumb phone into a smartphone. Start researching something other than a concert. There's no excuse. It's all there. We need to become curious again and not angry anymore. Anger robs you of the energy you need to be curious. Right, right. That's a good be point. children again. Here's a big one. Stop hanging around broke people. If you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the tenth. When I was coming up, 
in Compton, California. I needed a job as a bus boy. I wasn't very good at it, but I needed a job. I got on the bus, they called it RTD, Rough, Tough and Dirty. We, 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 that was a nickname in LA, Rapid Transit District. And I took the bus an hour and a half from Compton and ultimately South Central LA to Malibu. Because I was gonna work at a restaurant, it wasn't gonna be a raggedy one, it was gonna be one where the rich people were. I didn't understand, I know rich and wealthy, I just knew somebody had a nice car. I went, then I got there, like, okay, these are bankers and these accountants, that's nice. But then I want to understand where wealth is. So I then became a waiter, the worst shift they had possible in Malibu, California, deep Malibu at Joffrey's Malibu restaurant. Never told this story either. Uh, Joffrey's restaurant, Joffrey Etienne, who's the owner, God rest his soul. Harvey Baskin, who walked around with a Jesus robe every day, Jewish. And he's worked $200 million in, a billion dollars, maybe $2 billion a day. I went there and worked long enough to be able to quit that raggedy job as a waiter to become an assistant to Harvey Baskin. So I didn't go to college, so I wanted a college degree through mentoring. So I want to be obsessed with mentoring, obsessed with internships, obsessed with apprenticeships. This was my mentoring internship apprenticeship. I worked for this dude, paid me $19,000, $20,000 a year. So I went to, I went, one day I asked him to go to dinner. And we got dinner at a fancy restaurant, his choice. And I asked, I peppered him with questions the whole night. At the end, the bill came. And he pushed the bill to me. It was 100 bucks Back then, a lot of money. I pushed the bill back to him. He pushed the bill back to me. You know, I knew him pretty well. I pushed the bill back to him. I said, man, come on, what's up, man? You're the rich dude at the table. I'm, I mean, you're the one that's banging. I, you pay me peanuts. What, you want me to pay this? Like, slavery's over. He looked at me. He said, John, you got to figure out what game you want to play. You want to rich, you, you want to, you, you, what do you want to do? You want to, you want to, uh, uh, you want to rob my brain or rob my pocket? One last long. <laughs> Which one do you want to pay? I'll pay the bill, but you're not, you're not getting another thing out of me. Or yeah. take what you learned in this dinner as a PhD and pay the stupid bill. It's supposed to hurt. I paid the bill. I shut up. Life's not fair. Stop expecting life to be fair. Right. Work your tail off. Right. It's hard to hit a moving target. An entrepreneur works 18 hours a day to keep from getting a job. This is a big one. No one's going to give you anything. You cannot build wealth nine to five. By the way, I work jobs. It's important to work jobs. But you cannot build wealth nine to five. You can get rich. You can only build wealth in your sleep. Stocks, bonds, small business, big business, investments, entrepreneurship, education. You can only build wealth in your sleep annuities we have got to change our game so so it's it basically all i've said is a mental shift and most of all george healing we have got to stop all of this running around in circles it's getting us nowhere we need a we need a black bill gates more than we need a black president I loved Obama. I loved Obama. I served him as an advisor. Brilliant dude. I got no buts. Get brought class to the White House. But we need a black Bill Gates a hundred times more than we need a black uh, a black president. We need a black uh, Warren Buffett. We know, I, we where, where are these folks? When we look at our icons, we go to sports figures, love them, great, and entertainers, love them, great. But you can't scale. I can't scale Oprah. I love Oprah. She gave me hundred thousand dollars. God bless her. I can't scale Oprah. She's a personality. I can't scale LeBron. We need tens of thousands of jobs. We need, we, we need somebody who's making 20 billion so that underneath that 20 billionaire CEO, there are a thousand hundred millionaires. And underneath that you have, you know, I don't know, 2,000, 10 millionaires. And underneath that you have, I don't know, uh, you know, 10,000, 100,000 heirs. You see what I'm saying? Because all those folks are going to do philanthropy in their communities. They're going to go back where they came from and hook them up. That's what, see, Bedford's going to give me one of my few amens. He only does that when you talk. But he's, he's actually just he give me a charity. Yeah, okay, that's the first time John made some sense. <laughs> we need to role model. We model what we see. What, last point. Why are our kids want to be rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers? Nothing wrong with rap stars, but I can't scale it. Nothing wrong with athletes. I can't scale it. I love it. It's amazing. Drug dealers, you shouldn't want to scale. But what, what, why do we want to be that? Because it's what we see. 
as symbols of success. That's what we see all the time. We need to, we need to make smart sexy at scale. We're getting pimped in Africa right now because we don't understand financial literacy. We, we are literally giving Africa away to China. That's, right. That's a whole other show you need to do. That's right. And I mean, let, I can break down deals that I've been, been that I've witnessed where African leaders mean well, but they're financially illiterate, and they're literally giving the country. You know, the the, the the largest minority group marrying Black African women in fifty four countries in Africa. Mm-mm. What? Chinese men. Is that right? Yes, sir. And it's not because they're in love with, with black women either. Although when you go black, you don't go back. That's not the reason why. It's because China doesn't succeed without low cost of goods. They can't be the low cost producer in the world unless the, the natural minerals that they produce with are at the rock bottom cost. So if you and I get in a commercial dispute, now they've locked their whole business model on low cost goods. What's the number one place for untapped natural resources in the world? Africa. Now. Right. If you if you and I are doing business, George, and we have a dispute, you say, John, go spit, go away. We're done. But if I'm mad at your sister, we work it out. <laughs> We're family. We work it out. They just locked in, intertwined their whole business model with Africa. This is a game being played here, and we're being played by it. We're not playing masters of it. And that's what I want us to trans. Form. Yeah. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Uh, all of it was awesome. I, I loved how you began. And, and it reminds me of Alcoholics Anonymous has the best addiction program in the world. It's been copied by every major institution that deals with addiction. And the first step in the 12 step program is simply this in order to become sober, you must first admit that you're a drunk. That's right. right? That's how you start it, right? Yeah. Right. We got we we have a challenge, but we can get beyond this challenge. We can do things. I, I love your prescription. All of those things are spot on. There was something there for everyone. Um, who are your mentors? <coughs> who are your mentors? Uh in no particular order, uh, Ambassador Andrew Young. Yes. Uh, these are mentors and friends. Quincy Jones, or Sabiro Yuzawa out of Japan. Uh, Dr. Dorothy Hyde, God rest her soul. Um, Bishop T.D. Jakes, who's become a new friend and a mentor. Uh, the guy is just genius. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Bishop Blake. Um, at, at, in Extensia, Frederick Douglass and Dr. King. Uh, Malcolm X, we've been, we've been bamboozled, we've been tricked, we've been fooled. Right, right. <laughs> um, uh, you, um, Reverend Leon Sullivan. Um, yeah. There's, you know, there's so many heroes and sheroes, Harriet Tubman, um, but also Tony Ressler, who is a billionaire uh, owner of the Atlanta Hawks and uh, is a partner with one of my businesses. This, this, if there's anybody who deserved an honorary black man title, he award, he, he should get it. It's a, it's, this boy is this boy is bad. He said, "Black folks, we need." He said, "John, I can't say it, but you can." He said, "Look, black folks need to stop all this whining about civil rights and race." He said, "Look, is racism real? Yes. I mean, people racist against Jews. He said, but am I gonna sit around whining about it? No. Like you need access to capital, <laughs> as much education you can shove down your throat, and executed opportunity at scale so you can build wealth and have some money and decide to ignore somebody if you want to, or buy or." Or buy the little raggedy restaurant where they discriminated against you at. <laughs> right, right. Tony right, Ressler. Right, right, so I, right. it's a number of heroes here yeah. um, that I call mentors. Uh, um, final question. Well, boy, that hour went quick. Um, how do you stay inspired? How do you stay motivated? What is it that you? What's what's your regimen psychologically, or may there may even be a physical regimen? How do you stay inspired and motivated? Uh, I've removed toxic people from my life. I start that. I'm allergic to toxic people. I take no for vitamins. And and I look, I, I love everybody, but I don't deal with everybody. If you're toxic, if you're negative, you have to go, but you gotta get the heck out of here. I just don't, I just don't tolerate it. Uh, yeah. You will never know that you're invisible to me. <laughs> but once I've written you off, hey, uh, you, yeah. what, what, hi, you invisible. Hey, hi, hi. 
that. Yeah. I'm just trying to get you through past me as soon as possible. So I'm more, I am just consciously oblivious to most things around me. You love me, great. You hate me, great. You, 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 you admire me. I appreciate you. You despise me. Your, your choice. I, I, I just am oblivious. And yeah. until there's somebody who's my mentor or somebody I respect, now if they jamming me up. I know they come from a good place. Yeah. But, but I don't tolerate BS and drama and mess. And I hate messiness. I, I just hate. Uh, I just hate. I think emotional messiness is one of the big ways folks get you off your game and they get you arguing about stuff that don't matter, uh, complaining about stuff that, you know, you know, we had a whole debate. We don't have time for this, but it was a whole debate about some brother's company we don't own who went to the Supreme court uh, talking about some, some company that we don't have a share in about somehow this was a civil rights. No, it wasn't civil rights. It was his rights. I mean, that was a commercial dispute between him and the company. Now you want to give every black person a share in the company. Okay. Now it's a civil rights. Dispute. Black folks spent four months, the whole race of people talking about somebody else's business. We, it, this stuff drives me nuts. So uh, I, I, I just get up in the morning. First of all, I pray every night. And when I get in the, when I get in the morning, I said, thank you, Lord. And I hope that the devil was saying, oh, crap, he's up. <laughs> um, I work up, <laughs> I work out uh, 15 minutes every morning. You got to get your cardio up. Uh, I get myself centered and quiet, internally quiet before I do anything else. Uh, before I read an email, before I get my, you gotta get your armor on, you gotta get yourself in a good space. I have a smoothie, I have a wellness regimen, um, I take my vitamins, and uh, I do a little workout, as I've already said, and then I get into it. Um, and um, I don't I don't get tired, because I, I love what I do. I get exhausted. Yeah. I get worn out, but I don't get tired. Yeah. Anybody watching this gets tired, they need to go find something else to do. That means that you're not living your mission, you're not living your truth. Uh, I absolutely love every moment. And I guess the biggest thing, George, is this. The Bible suggests be hot or be cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spat you out. Translation, even God doesn't like mediocrity. So if, if you just go into the motions, if you have pregnant, if, you, if you're not excited about anything, what are you doing? But, and why? <laughs> so whatever you do, do it with both feet. You're going to be a jerk. Be the best jerk the world's ever seen. Whatever you're going to do, do it with both feet and with absolute dominance, prominence, passion, and peace. Um, so I'm just in love with love. And I love my people. And I, I love you enough to, I, I really respect me and learn to like me, then like me and never respect me. So I hope people like me from this program, but I'm accept, but, I, but I'm cool if they don't. Mm -hmm. I'm cool that I've made everybody completely uncomfortable. <laughs> because maybe that's what you need. It's what I needed. I, I don't need somebody to pat me on the head. I need you to shake me up. And uh, before, can I leave you one last thing, George? Sure. Uh, so some folks might say, oh, he's an inspiring guy. He's a motivational speaker. I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm a CEO. I'm an entrepreneur. And I walk my talk. So in the middle of COVID-19, I want you to call Operation Hope. The organization that I finance myself and I founded myself has done $3.5 billion of invested in our neighborhoods, 4 million clients, raising credit scores 120 points in 24 months in 22 states. And we have a Hope in Hand app that you can download right now, it's free. And you call our toll-free number, 888-388-HOPE. Go to operationhope.org. All services are free. I want you to go and, and set your life right. I want you to get your financial literacy right. I want you to get your credit score up. I want you to restructure your government debt. I want you to restructure your mortgage, your, your credit cards, co to put every problem you got in the, co in the COVID bucket. Whatever problem you've had for 50 years, throw it in the COVID bucket, everybody will forgive you for it. If you, had, if you, needed, if you needed your sins forgiven, you need to go to God and, and get, get your moral sins forgiven, and all your financial Brett was losing it. You, all your financial sins and all your screw ups in your career, you can just, just throw it all in the COVID bucket. Somebody says, "Why are you credit talk? Oh, that was COVID. Well, why 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 ain't you been working? Oh, that was COVID. Well, why 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 you quit college? Well, that was COVID. Why did you get divorced? That was COVID. Why were you there for your children? That was COVID. You get a COVID pass. I want you to then reset your SS. <laughs> and and get your life right because because now you, God is giving you two months at home. Everybody break one to break. God gave you a break. Now we're complaining about being at home. Pull out that dream board. Reset your life. Let me tell you what I've been doing in here. I've been refining. Operation Hope has grown at 553% in five years. My website crashed two weeks ago, George. Mm -hmm. Crashed. 
This haven't crashed in 28 years. It crashed on one of Gail King's CBS show. And my white friends are like, oh, some free stuff for financial coaching? Give me that, right? <laughs> I want my people to grab this service. But here's the other thing. My for-profit company in real estate. Here's what I'm talking about. Ignore the noise. Listen to me now, everybody. Mental, mental space. Everybody's telling me real estate will crash. Oh, if you're a landlord, you're going to be in trouble. People are not going to pay you. You know what I said? Wait a minute. I, I own a hundred million dollars worth of homes. You know what? I I think that I think differently. What I think is if you're in an apartment building and you're paying a thousand fourteen hundred dollars a month in rent, and and you got people on, on top of you, to the left of you, right of you, you got you packed in, you got no social distancing. You know what? I think those people want to live in a single family detached home with a front yard and a backyard and fourteen hundred square feet for eleven dollars a month. So I told my people to, to to go market to them. You know what? My occupancy did this in the last two months. I got 94% of occupancy in the middle of COVID-19. I'm profitable, George, wow. running an auto business. I've got enough cash flow right now, even folks flake on me, to last for another year. This is just simply a <clears throat> me training my mind to be different. And there's going to be opportunities that's coming through COVID. On the upside, is America's going to be on wholesale. America's going to be on sale. Stocks under market. Bonds, not bonds, but stocks under market. Uh, real estate on on discount. Businesses are going to be need to merge. Uh, big companies like Gap are going to be shedding divisions. I want you to get your credit store, credit right. I want you to have a little bit of cash flow. I want to get your mind right because I don't want you complaining that you missed this train when let somebody else own the game. Right now, we're living in a moment in history. As my dad would say, right now, right now. So don't take this as some philosophical journey with George Frazier and it was a nice speech. No, no, no. History doesn't feel historic when you're sitting in it. It feels like another day. But that doesn't mean the moment you're in is not historic. Amen. John Hall Bryant, you are a beast. Right? And I mean that in a good way. I mean, you are just um, in beast mode. Every time I see you, every time I'm around you, uh, you are in beast mode. And I love you for that. Um, we even ran out of time for questions this time around. <laughs> Um, but this sorry, is replay and replay and replay. And it, 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 how can people get in touch with you? I mean, is there is there a way that they, if they have a question, is there a way that they can get in touch with you? Sure, my assistant will hate it, but Tina Fair uh -oh, uh -oh, is, uh -oh. is my assistant, and that my office is in Atlanta, Georgia. So if you're good enough to get to find Tina Fair in Atlanta, Georgia, then then you then you then you're as good as me tracking Andrew Young down for ten years. That's exactly what I did. I, I, I irritated that man so bad. He's like, who, who is this? Yeah, I'm mentoring you. Yeah, whatever. Just to shut you up. Yeah, fine. Come and meet with me. <laughs> um, yeah. And he's like my, my play father now. Um, so Tina Fair is my assistant, F-A-I-R. Um, go to operationhope.org for our services. Go to 888-3888-HOPE. That's our toll-free number. Our, our download, Hope in Hand, or get your own financial coach online. You can see a coach visually or deal with them on text or email or by phone. All services are free. Um, that's how you get a hold of me is, is get a hold of my team to transform your life. Um, and then, of course, you can always come to me through George. Hey, amen. Amen. Uh, Brother Bedford, we ran out of time for questions tonight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I apologize to you because Brother Bedford is the, out, out, in charge of Command Central and he manages the traffic. Um, I just enjoy seeing him crack up every now and then. That's, that's, that's been my pleasure tonight. Um, I, I just want to close by making our offer tonight. As you know, for each of our podcasts, we sort of have a lottery ticket for five a power networking conference registrations, a very, 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 very special deal. And so I just want to remind you, the conference, of course, has been moved to October the 14th to 17th. We want to see you there. It's in Houston uh, uh, at the Hilton of Americas. Yes, we will be having our conference. We're thinking positive. We're thinking, you know, we're, it's going to be just fine. Okay, so be there. Um, uh, but you made a mistake, Dr. George. You said five conference uh, certificates uh, you're giving away. But that doesn't include the five I'm paying for that you can also give away to your conference. Oh, Okay, well, <laughs> that's a whole nother. So let me let me tell you how this works. That's awesome, though. That's awesome. Uh, you you um. So he, here's what we're going to do. John Hope Bryant has said he's going to. Now we're going to charge John Hope Bryant 
the same price for this registration deal that we make available, right? Um, that we're going to charge you. So we're now going to, because normally we only allow five, right? Mm -hmm. And so the first five get this deal that I'm making from uh, the Power Networking Conference. The second five get John's deal, which is basically he's paying us for you to come. But the deal is simple. Um, a full registration at our conference is $1,500 for an adult, and a student registration is $800. You combine that, that's $2,300. We're going to reduce that by $1,900 and give you a student and one adult in one package for $399. The first five people get that deal. You get it by simply emailing me. You cannot go on the Power Networking Conference website. You cannot get that deal. Put it, uh, I'm in, I'm in. G Fraser at FraserNet.com. G Fraser at FraserNet.com. G Fraser at FraserNet.com. Um, put your cell phone number in the body of the email and your full name, your cell phone and full name. The first five get the special deal that we normally make. It's only limited to five. We normally get a lot more than that, but we only honor five. The second five, and it'll all be timestamped. You know, all emails are timestamped. The second five. We'll get John's deal. John's paying for that. It's, it's, it's a gift. I mean, it's love. John's paying for that. So that's how we're going to do it. So we're now limiting it to 10 tonight because John was gracious enough to, to, to do that. I mean, and I, I didn't ask him. I mean, that is just a, that's a gift of love. I, I, I really, really appreciate that, John. And I'm sure that our, our viewers tonight appreciate it. I want to close with a quote from Amos Wilson, Dr. Amos Wilson, because this so reminds me of you in terms of your vision for us. And it was Dr. Amos Wilson who said in 1994, he died in 1995. He said, our refusal as black people to confront the issues of money and wealth is going to end up with our very lives being threatened as people on this earth. That's what he said. He said that in 19, you can see it on the, his YouTube video on, uh, on YouTube, 1994, he died in 1995. You, John Hope Bryant, have recognized that. 28 years ago, you took action to mitigate that and to help us to understand and to deal with the issues of money by way of financial education, financial literacy, providing services and products to our people that move them forward in this space. We love you for that. We are indebted for you uh, that. We hope that you spend the rest of your life doing that. And um, you have inspired me I've learned so much from you. Thank you for being supportive of our WINS Wealth Building Centers and curriculum, which we put into the faith-based community and to our black churches and giving them a system to educate their congregations. Thank you for being supportive of that. And as you know, there's 47 million black people uh, in America. There is enough work in this space for everybody. Yep. And <clears throat> Stay the course, my brother. Um, brother Bedford, do you have any closing thoughts? Anything you want to say? You've been patiently quiet tonight. He normally isn't, John. But uh, <laughs> George, I, I mean, I think John O'Brien has said it all. I, I did have a question, but I, we're going to save it for another time because you said something that sparked. We'll have him back. Yeah, we'll have you back. That I really wanted you to unpack something, but we'll save it for another time. I've taken copious notes. Got quite a few quotes over here. So I just want to say thank you for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with our audience. And I really appreciate it. My, my deep honor. I can be you're a winner too. Hey, uh, Dr. Dr. Frazier, you know, Benjamin Mays was Dr. King's mentor. 
um, president of Morehouse, he said that the greatest sin was not failure, it was low aim. Mm. That's right. Okay. You'd be good, my brother. Thank you for the gift. Um, and I, on behalf of those, it's already it's already almost full. Um, thank you for that, man. That That is generous. And uh, we love you, man. And stay the course. We're going to have you back. But there's just too much, too much information to, to unpack. We just didn't have enough time. And we promised people a crisp hour. We already went over by 15 minutes, but uh, all worth it. All worth it. We could have gone another hour. That's yeah. I just want you, George, I just want you to know, I'm happy to be generous to support your movement. And I'm so happy to send you my combination of food stamps, Mexican pesos, and Russian rubles uh, to pay for that. I'll okay. take them. I'll take them. And post dated checks. All right. If you have any, if you have any yen, you can throw some yen in there. Whatever, brothers and sisters, it was an, an awesome evening with the awesome um, winner, winner in his mind and in his heart and in his spirit, John Hope Ryan. Thank you, John. Have a good evening. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you, brother Bedford. <laughs>